For this video, I wanted to take a look at this stereo receiver. Recently picked this up for free on my local Craigslist. And this is an RCA RT2250. And I wasn't quite sure what to do with it initially. Um, I mean, I've thought about maybe trying to clean it up and uh, see if it's functional, maybe even use it. But as you can see, it's in really rough shape. It's very dirty. The frame is been smashed and tweaked here. The volume knob is missing. Um, the person I got this from said it had been sitting outside in the elements for who knows how long. I mean, who knows if it's been rained on or what. So I think what I'm going to do instead of trying to fix it up, clean it up, and use it, I think I'm going to use it as a teardown. Um, we'll tear it down, look at the construction on the inside, and I'm also going to scavenge it for any parts that I can that I might be able to use on future projects. So this will just be a teardown video and then I'll be looking for things that you might be able to take off if you have something like this as a project of your own. Before I even take it apart, I'm curious if it even works. So I've gone ahead and plugged it in and let's hit the power button here and see what happens. Oh, relay clicked. It's flashing tuner. It's on the tape input apparently. Volume knob works. I don't have any speakers plugged in. I don't have a source connected to it, but it appears to actually work. Kind of amazing given uh, the condition it's in. So anyway, let's just go ahead and tear it down and see what it looks like inside. With the cover off, this is what it looks like on the inside. It's even dirtier in here than it is on the outside. I mean, initially you can see we've got a couple of very large capacitors here. Could probably salvage those and maybe use them on some other project. Got a very beefy transformer back here. Might be able to use that for something else. I'm not sure if I want to keep that around because it is a very large transformer on there. Um, I'm not even sure what the specs rating are power-wise on this receiver, but with such a big transformer, it probably puts out a decent amount of power. Obviously, you got the heat sink here. So somewhere mounted on the heat sink, maybe visible from the underside, there should be a row of transistors, power transistors, to generate all the power for the speakers. And then this heat sink here is what dissipates all the heat. And I have to get in closer, but I wouldn't be surprised if those are all the voltage regulators for the different power rails in here. And then there's one vertical board here. It's the only digital board in here, and it looks like it's going to be the board for the digital audio input and output. And then everything else is just like a single-sided circuit board like that. So... Let's go ahead and clean this up and then have a closer look. So right in here in this power circuitry is some of the, the neatest stuff going on here. I mean obviously the first thing you see are these two enormous capacitors. Uh, these are rated at 10,000 microfarads each. So pretty good reservoir of energy can be stored in those large capacitors. I'm not sure if I'm going to keep them after all. I mean they're really big and I don't know if I would ever need anything even remotely near that level. But um, right here, this heat sink, I'll definitely take that heat sink off. And you can't quite see it, but there are four pins coming out from under there. So this, my guess, would be the bridge rectifier for the whole uh, receiver. And they've got it mounted up off the board. There's a lot of airspace under there and then the large heat sink. So if you think about it, you know, if this is a you know, 100, 150 watt receiver, so then you have potentially 100, 150 watts of energy going through this rectifier, so you gotta dissipate all the heat from that, so that's why they've got a heat sink on there. Um, there's a row of fuses here, I'll definitely grab all those fuses assuming they're good, and there's a couple more over here under this upper board you can't see. And then here you've got some uh, filter capacitors on the DC side, and it's not really showing up on the video, but these two right here are bulging on top. They're not smooth. These are flat on top, but these are bulged on top here. 
So my guess is the previous owners probably ran this receiver a little loud, I guess you could say, and really stressed the components of this. I mean, they're, they're no-name capacitors, YEC brand, never heard of them. I'm sure their specs aren't that good, but um, being that this was college student owned, I'm sure they probably pushed it to its limit. So I think I'm just going to start tearing this apart and taking things out. I mean, you know, you do things like you just start ripping ribbon cables off and all the other connectors and then basically just start taking screws out and look for things as you go. And I don't think I'm going to try and film this. I mean, I don't know how exciting it's going to be to watch someone take a bunch of screws out. But um, if I come across interesting things along the way, I'll take note of it. So I've started taking off some of the wire harnesses. Found a couple of interesting things. Thought this was kind of a definite hack here. Just two red wires doing a jumper from one location to another. I'm guessing that's the engineer's way of saying, oops, we were supposed to run a wire there and didn't. So that's kind of a afterthought bodge there. Something else kind of interesting. So all of the wire bundles here, they're connectors on one side that hook into the board but the other side, they're all soldered to the circuit board. So every single wire in here is soldered to at least one board. They didn't put a connector on both ends. They soldered the other end onto the motherboard. I'm not sure that that saved anything, but apparently it did save. And they definitely took cable tie management seriously. They were. This is just the zip ties I've cut off thus far. So and the other annoying thing so the transformers mounted down with four screws. Three of the four came out just fine, and the fourth is stripped. So I can't even get the transformer out without resorting to more serious tools. But I think I'll just leave it there. It's working on taking some of the boards out, and I got this double board assembly out, which was right in here in the middle. So this top board here, this metal can here, this is an RF can for radio frequencies, and indeed right here, these are the connectors where the antenna is plugged in. And so you need a shielded area to decode the radio frequency. And they've even got some trimmers on there. But what I think is kind of interesting, so you've got this board, it's pretty much all surface mount construction. And if we flip it over here and look at the back side, there's like a handful, I mean there's a tiny transistor there, there's another one up here. There's like five or six surface mount items on the back of this board here. And given how few there are, I would have thought it would have been simpler to design it with all through hole components instead of doing just like half a dozen items on the back of that board. It just seems like that would have raised the cost of production, not lowered it. So, and this board has a couple of chips on the back of it. But yeah, surprised to see surface mount on the back of that board. So turning the receiver over to get more screws out, I found they actually put a bottom access panel in here. Which is kind of surprising. I feel like fewer and fewer electronics they're doing this. I think to save costs they just omit this step and just do a solid case, but hmm. There's a couple of surface mount components on that board there. So there's some big plugs in here. These are probably those capacitors and the bridge rectifiers. There was a tiny onboard transformer. You can see they've got it in the silk screen right here. So can't access all of the board, but you need to do servicing on it maybe you'll get lucky be able to access the area you can do it's interesting I don't know if I'll be able to get it on camera so right in here you can see there's a strip where the board has kind of a yellowish hue to it running sideways right there it's green here it's green here and it's kind of yellowed here and this is where that line of potentially voltage regulators I haven't looked at them yet that's where they're all mounted to that heat sink. So basically right here the board is discolored from heat. 
The heat sink's not taking away all of the heat and the board got discolored there. So, and yes, it bit me when taking it apart. I feel like that's kind of par for the course. It's uh, the electronics way of getting revenge at you for taking it apart. It bites you. So I got this amplifier module out here. And I mean, you got some large capacitors on there, some coils, you got some really big power resistors. I'll probably take those off the board, those power resistors there, because those are pretty big, dissipate a lot of heat. Might need one of those again. And then it's kind of hard to see, but down in there are the different amplifier chips all mounted to the heat sink. And there are six sets of amplifiers and a smaller transistor or something in between them. And if you come around to the back of the receiver and look, right there are four speaker terminals and then two more, sub and center. So I'm guessing each individual speaker has a different channel on here, and so that's what those all are. But I don't think I'm going to keep the heatsink. That's just too large and special purpose, if you will. It's not a very good generic heat sink. But probably take those power resistors off and I don't know, I might look at what the amplifiers are on there, but they're probably too special purpose and I'm not gonna bother keeping any of the capacitors out of here. I mean, capacitors nowadays are pretty darn cheap. You can get them for less than a dollar each. The top quality ones so it's, there's really no reason to sacrifice them, but, you know, some things like these large capacitors, I don't know for sure, but if I had to guess, I'd say these are probably 15 maybe $20 each. So if I had a need for those, I would definitely take them. That's, you know, a good savings of money right there, but um, heat sinks aren't cheap, and, you know, the heat sink's not going to wear out, so I'll definitely take those. So I ended up taking those large capacitors out. I don't think I'll use them myself, but maybe someone else can find a use for them. And mainly I was just kind of curious if I could get them off the circuit board. They were rather large traces and they're obviously a large component, so I wasn't sure if they would come out easily. But uh, the solder actually heated up and came out very nicely. So they pretty much just dropped out of the board. And also while working on it, the fourth screw that was stripped out came loose and I was able to get the transformer out and this thing has some weight I mean I'd estimate that's 10-15 pounds of metal they definitely put a large transformer in there I don't know what it's rated at but I'm guessing it can put a lot of power through there so I got that amp module pulled out and separated and here are all the chips on that circuit board or ICs I should say so it's kind of interesting. If you come in, each channel is 1624 and 2493 until you get to the very last one or first one, I guess, if you're starting on this one. And these are a different amplifier chip. So my guess is, is this channel here is the subwoofer, and then these are the left, right, and center channels over there. So that, to me, would be the only explanation as to why that channel has different amplifiers versus the other channels. The last piece to tear down is the digital front panel connector here. And we'll have to see what's in here. Maybe there are some LEDs we can scrounge, or certainly like a potentiometer for the volume here. Actually, it's probably a rotary encoder and going to be some tactile switches so yeah let's open it up see what we got when you get the front disassembled this is what you've got just a bunch of tiny little boards on here and a couple of interesting things so i guess if you needed s video or composite video connectors you could scavenge those off there it's a very nice rotary encoder Although for that to be useful, you'd basically have to have a digital logic board because it just sends pulses out as it's rotated and not of much use unless you have a, a decoder for it. But that, 
Um, just a couple of switches and an LED. Lots of wiring here and there if you needed bits of wire. Very nice. Looks like gold plated. A uh, large headphone connector. I think that's a quarter inch headphone connector. This board here is kind of interesting. First off, you got a an RF. I'm sorry, not RF. Uh, infrared receiver on here for the remote control. So that you could definitely take off and use in another project. And then this here, this is a call it a vacuum fluorescent display, I believe. And it's probably of no use because it's so specialized to this purpose, but it's kind of interesting to look at the construction. So over here on the side, you can see glass tube came out and then it was like sealed. And my guess is inside here, as the name implies, vacuum fluorescent, they probably have a vacuum in here or maybe they pumped in an inert gas like argon. So they pumped it in through here or you know pumped all the air out and then they sealed the glass so that created a sealed environment in there. And then I've seen a couple of these before and they all have it. There's always a burn mark in the vacuum fluorescent display right there like that. And I'm guessing it's part of the manufacturing process. So I, I have no idea what that's for but just kind of interesting. And then the last board here if you needed tactile switches, here's a ton of them. You could scavenge this for lots of them. And one thing that's kind of interesting, so it had a like a rotary switch on the front with a button in the center, and that interfaced onto this here. So this plastic dial here rotates around, and then there's just a standard tactile switch in the center. But what was interesting, see if I can get it here. So right there, made by a company, Alps, and I've actually heard of them before. They're, they make switches for a lot of uh, mechanical keyboards. You might find ALP switches in them. So apparently they do all kinds of switches and user interface controls like this. So yeah, there you go. That's, that's the dis disassembly of a fairly modern home theater audio video receiver. Lots of interesting things in there. Um, definitely if you're into projects, a lot of things you could scavenge and use. Fuses and screws and wires and just all sorts of stuff. So yeah, hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching.